Prayer is so important when you have huge life decisions, which we have constantly as a military family. We have, when you move, when you're doing all those kinds of things, um, you, prayer is the way that I get through it. When the decision comes to us, we make the decision. I think it brings a lot of peace and a lot of confidence that um, that decision is in God's will. And I think that's uh, the most important thing when we're making those decisions. Especially being in the, the ICBM career field, there's, that's, if you really stop to think about it, that's a lot of, a lot of weighty issues that potentially can run through your mind. And if, if you don't know that, if you're not confident that God's in control of everything that's going on, not just within your little piece of the, uh, of your career field and your job and what you're doing, but the whole crazy world, which is, is also affecting your job, then it can be a really stressful and really <laughs> anxiety in, inducing thing. And uh, I think prayer definitely helps cut through that. Well, surprises are a way of life. And if you don't like surprises, I'll tell you right now, life's gonna be rough. Because <laughs> there's so many things that happen that you just don't plan on, you don't see coming. I, I took some time this last weekend and asked our, a number of our staff members and some of our board members just to share with me if they'd experienced any surprises since the first of the year. I can't even, go, I can't give you the whole list. I'll give you a few of the surprises that some of our staff members and board members have experienced since the first of the year. Here's one. We were getting excited for the birth of a second son and announced it in our family Christmas letter. We're having a boy. Then we went to the doctor's checkup and surprise, it's a girl. <laughs> okay, great, surprise. There's little surprises, big surprises. Here's another person shared. I was having a bad season and feeling discouraged. This is one of our younger staff members. I was having a bad season and feeling discouraged, wondering if I am on the right path. As I walked to my car, parked out on Garden Road in front of the church after work, I saw a piece of paper under the windshield wiper, and my stomach dropped, a ticket on top of everything else. Surprise, it was an encouraging note thanking me for the joy I bring to their life and for all the ministry I do for Shoreline, and encouraging me to keep fighting the good fight. It changed the course of my mindset in a wonderful way. You know what was interesting? It was an anonymous, positive note. Yes, that's allowed. Uh, <laughs> another person shared, we decided to have some work done in our home and had the pipes, which were very old, all replaced. It always feels good to finish a home project. I got a call in the middle of a meeting at church. Surprise, one of the water pipes had burst and our bedroom and bathroom were completely flooded. Not all surprises are good surprises. Another one, I got some family news. Surprise, my dad has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It has been unexpected and tough, and it has also led to a precious season with my dad. Another person shared this. I started the new year with the usual hope and excitement, but surprise. On January 20, I received news that my daughter-in-law's father passed away. The next day, I received two texts during my Bible study class telling me that my mother had passed away at 96 years old. On January 31st, I got word that my uncle passed away while swimming in the ocean, as he did often. It was one of his favorite things. He was 94 years old. Wouldn't you love to be swimming in the ocean at 94, right? But within about 11 days, this person walked through the loss of three different family members. One more. We received a random text from our high school son with a picture attached. This could go a lot of ways. <laughs> Surprise! It said, I was one of seven in my class to receive this. And there was a picture of an award he received for a 4.5 grade point average. He plays three sports, and honestly, we had no idea. <laughs> um, surprises just kind of come rolling up on the shore of our life. Over and over again, like waves on a seashore. And sometimes they're wonderful and sweet, and sometimes they're little tough things, and sometimes they're massive life-changing moments. But Nehemiah understood this. Nehemiah's story in the Bible is a surprising story. It's a story of surprises. You know, Nehemiah is going through a normal work day. He has a guest come from Jerusalem. He gets news on how bad things are there. And within a few days, 
He's packing up from this great job he has in this place that seems to be very comfortable for him and making a move to a really challenging new time of rebuilding the wall in the midst of tons of conflict, which we talked about all that conflict last week. Nehemiah understood the reality of surprises, but Nehemiah also understood that if you have some constants, some things that stay the same, whatever surprise comes your way, life is better. And today we're going to look at the major constant thing that Nehemiah deals with wherever he is, whether he's in Susa, the capital, on his way to Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, whether times are good or bad, there's one constant that never changed for Nehemiah. That's what we're going to focus on today. And as I was thinking about how, how helpful it is to have something that's constant and how that alleviates worry and stress in the midst of a changing world, I thought of this one scene from a movie called Hoosiers. It's a movie about a, a Hickory, Indiana, this high school team that makes it to the finals. And they, they, they come from this teeny little town. And when they walk into the, into the auditorium where they're going to be playing, and you'll see it in a moment on this video, all, on all these players, they're anxious, they're worried, they're surprised by how mammoth this space is and it's going to be filled with people. And, and you can see on their faces that they're really worried and anxious. But then the coach does something. He points out a constant that doesn't change. And I want you to watch in this video clip how their faces change when they realize this constant. Watch the screen. Buddy, hold this under the backboard. What is it? Fifteen feet. Fifteen feet. Strap, put Ollie on your shoulders. Measure this uh, from the rim. Buddy? How far? Ten feet. Ten feet. I think you'll find it's the exact same measurements as our gym back in Hickory. <laughs> okay, let's get dressed for practice. I love that. He says, listen. When you stand on the free throw line here and shoot, the hoop's the same distance away, it's the same height. There's constants. And you can see these, these young guys that are anxious in that space, and they're kind of like, oh, that's right. We're playing basketball, and there's some things that stay constant. Well, Nehemiah says, wherever you go, whatever you do, there is one constant that will give you strength and security and power to press through it. And for Nehemiah, it's simply this, that God is always present, and you can talk to him. Prayer. Prayer is the constant that we can take anywhere we go. If you're in the military, wherever you get stationed. If you're, if you're a student, whoever your roommate is. As you're walking through life, one constant that Nehemiah teaches us is that the presence of God and prayer is always ours if we walk with Jesus. And so nine different times, Nehemiah talks about prayer or prays and teaches us this beautiful reality that, that prayer is the constant. So let's look at these prayers together. Open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1. And, and we're going to walk through the book of Nehemiah and look at these different prayers. And learn how we can navigate life's surprises by praying through everything we experience. Nehemiah 1, 6 to 7. This is in the middle of Nehemiah's prayer. And listen to his prayer. He says, oh God, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayers, the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. And listen to this prayer. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Powerful prayer lesson number one is this. Confession without caution. And whatever you're going through at any time, you can talk to God, and if you want to confess your sins, you can confess your sins. And he's a God who forgives and brings grace. But I love that this is a confession without caution. Nehemiah says, I've sinned. My family's sinned. We confess our sins. He doesn't hold it back. We need to learn when we pray to God and confess our sins to bring confession without caution. We don't come to God like this. Well, God, I, uh, I might have messed up. I, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Um, 
I might have stepped out of line a little bit, but my motives were good, and I'm a pretty good guy, but I might have, and so God, you know, I, I let you know that since you have stringent rules, I might have slightly stepped out of the lines, but I really, you know, you don't, that's not confession. I blew it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I acknowledge that my thoughts went where they shouldn't have gone. My words were spoken the way I shouldn't have spoken them or words I shouldn't have said. I did things I shouldn't have done. I failed to do a good thing I knew you wanted me to do and I just walked right past it. God, I confess it. Confession without caution. We live in a day and age now where we're so careful to say anything out loud because someone could be recording it. They probably are. Are you paranoid? No. I just know that everyone has a phone. <laughs> And, and, and we're, and, and we're you know, maybe afraid to write out a prayer of confession because what if somebody got it and they tweeted it or sent it out and said, oh, you know, so-and-so confessed this to God, but look what they did. I mean, we, it's like we want to kind of guard ourselves, but in our own hearts before God, we can confess without holding back, without caution. God, I blew it. I messed up. And there's something so powerful in confession. When you know you've messed up, when I know I've messed up, to come to God and say, God, man, I blew it. I'm sorry. And we're not surprising God with anything. That's why Jesus came. He knew all of our sins. He loved us anyways. He gave us his life for our sins so we don't have to hide them from God, so we can confess to God without caution. There's a wonderful prayer of confession that's actually found in the Psalter Hymnal, which is a hymn book uh, that really goes through hymns written off, off the Psalms. But listen to this prayer. As a matter of fact, better than listen, would you join in this prayer, in your own heart, this prayer of confession? Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our heart, our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had in us the mind of Christ. You alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts, by wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray, most merciful Father, and free us from our sin. Renew in us the grace and strength of your Holy Spirit. And for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, do these things. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? It, I encourage you in your prayer life, when you stumble, when you fall, when you sin, don't make excuses to God. He knows. Just come and say, God, I confess. And he's ready to forgive. He's ready to restore. Prayer number two. Nehemiah 1, 8 to 9. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands... Even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizons, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. I will bring them back to Jerusalem. In his prayer, Nehemiah says, God, remember what you told Moses. You told Moses that if your people will confess and repent and turn back to you, no matter where they're scattered, you'll bring them home again. So, so Nehemiah is actually praying God's promises back to God. So here's powerful prayer lesson number two. Pray God's promises. Pray the promises of God. Well, how do I know God's promises? Read this book every day of your life. And when God declares something as a promise for us, we can hold to that. So you can pray to God as, as you confess. And we just talked a moment ago about confession. We, you can pray to God, oh God, in the book of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, you tell us, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just, and you will forgive all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh God, I confess my sins. Remind me that I'm cleansed. Remind me that I'm forgiven. Remind me that my sins are thrown in the deepest sea. And as far as the east is from the west, you've removed my sins and my wrongs from me. Oh God, remind me of this truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're praying scripture. You're praying God's promise. You're saying, God, you say, if I confess my sins, you are faithful. You can pray the scriptures to God and pray his promises and ask him to act in accordance with his promises. You know what God wants to do? He wants to act in accordance to his promises. And his Bible's filled with them. You, you can pray. You can say, oh God, in Philippians chapter four, in Philippians chapter four, you told your people to be anxious about nothing, 
but in everything with prayer and petition to make our requests known to you. And that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Oh God, I want to be anxious about nothing, so I pray to you. And God, you promise that your peace that passes all understanding will be mine. Oh God, give me that peace as I tell you what's on my heart, as I bring my anxieties to you. Fill me with your peace for Jesus' sake and for my good, I pray. Amen. All you're doing there is praying the promises of God. But there's power in that. And Nehemiah prayed that. Nehemiah said, God, you promised Moses that if your people repent, you'll bring them back home again. He's praying the promises of God back to God. You can pray that way. You should pray that way. So immerse yourself in the Bible. Know God's promises and then pray his promises into your own life. It's powerful. Prayer number three. Nehemiah 1.11 Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. I love this. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Nehemiah is about to go to the king and make a request, a big request. And so he prays, grant me favor, grant me success as I do this. Do you know it's not only okay, but it's right that you would ask God, for his favor on your life and for success. Just make sure you're asking God for something that pleases him. Following me? Don't ask for some dumb thing that God doesn't want that you shouldn't be doing and say, God, why don't you bless that? That doesn't make any sense. But when you're doing what God wants you to do, when you're living the way God wants you to live, when you're following his will for your life, it's good to pray for favor and success. If you're a student and you're studying, is it okay to pray, oh God, give me your favor and help me be successful in my schoolwork? Absolutely. We have a lot of language students here that are at DLI and they're learning complex languages. It takes them sometimes a year, year and a half. And, and I hope you're praying, God, give me favor and God, give me success. But can I suggest, if you have a big test, don't bring that prayer at three o'clock in the morning when the test is at seven o'clock and have done no study and preparation, hoping that your prayer will somehow teach you the language. Because, you know, be praying every week and for months in advance. Lord, I pray for favor and success as I study. God, I pray for your favor as I try to stay focused. Lord, I pray for your favor that I'm not distracted by this show or that show or this video game, but I can stay focused. And we pray for God's favor all the way along. Does that make sense? And then when it comes time for test day, and I also pray God for favor, bring to my mind all that I've studied. Give me success because, Lord, I've done the best I can to prepare. And what I don't have the ability to do, God, you fill in the blanks for me. And then God delights to step into those situations. Pray for his favor. If you're looking for a job, pray that God will provide a job, but also do all the things you need to do. Partner with God in that journey, but say, God, give me favor. Lord, I pray for a job that provides the resources to provide for me or if I have a family for my family. And God, I pray you'd show me favor as I have this interview, as I fill this form out, as I meet with this person. I pray you'll bring me success. God delights to hear those kind of prayers. And God answers those prayers, not always exactly how we want, but God is at work and God is listening. So Nehemiah models prayer in so many different ways. Here's prayer number four. Nehemiah chapter two, verses four to five. I love this prayer because it's, it's like a, this little beep in the middle of things. Watch how this goes. Nehemiah 2, 4. The king said to me, what is it you want? So he's in a conversation with the king. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in, your, in his sight... Let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I may, can rebuild it. He makes the request. Do you see what's happening? He's in this conversation. He's with the king of Persia, one of the most powerful nations on the, in the world at that time. And he's having a conversation and the king says, what is it you want? And then it says, then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king all in one sentence. What do you think that looked like? So Nehemiah's having a conversation and the king says, what is it you need? And Nehemiah went, hang on a second. Okay, here's what I need. Is that, you think that's how it went? No. Do you think it went like this? The king says, what is it you need? And Nehemiah said, oh God, give me wisdom and show me what I should do right now. And then, and then well, here's what, I, no, it went like this. What is it you need? And quietly in his heart, Nehemiah says, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me the right word. Okay, here's what I need. Lord, show me favor. Here's, he's, he's in the midst of the conversation. He's in the midst of life. I prayed and then I spoke. 
We can do that. We should do that. Our, our entire days and weeks should be salted and peppered with these little prayers as we're just going through our day. And I prayed to the Lord and this, and I prayed to the Lord and this, and you're just kind of flowing through your day. And there's these little pop-up prayers all through our day talking to God. So you're driving down the road, and you see a car that's off the road, and there's, there's an ambulance there, and there's medical people there, and you're driving down the road. Well, don't bow your head and close your eyes. You're driving, right? You're driving. Just, but, but at that moment, instead of like, I wonder what happened, or I wonder what's going on, just start to pray as you're driving. Lord, there's, there's people there helping them. I know that there's professionals, but Lord, I pray you'll watch over that person who was in the accident. And Lord, if they're injured, Lord, would you care for their body right now through those professionals that are with them? And Lord, if they're not hurt, but now their whole day's upside down and they're getting towed away with their car, Lord, just be with them and show your presence. Just a little prayer as you're driving along. Lift up the prayers that you pray as you go through your day. You're in a class at school. Maybe you go to a university and you have a professor that is speaking poorly about Christians and about the church and questioning the Christian faith, which happens in some of our universities, right? So you're in a class and they start doing that. You know, do you, I'd say say a prayer right then. But like in the middle, it's not like in the middle of the class to, to go like this as the teacher's teaching and you go, dear God, cause my teacher to repent of their wrong. You know, don't do that. Um, but just as they're teaching in your heart, say, Lord. This person just doesn't know your love and doesn't know your grace, hasn't encountered your goodness. I pray for them, Lord, that you would show your face to them. And God, if there's some way you could shine through my life, I'm here. Just quietly in your heart. And then continue on with your schoolwork. All through the day, all through life, just pray in the moment, pray in the moment, pray in the moment. Prayer number five. Nehemiah four, four to five. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Nehemiah is working to get all the people to build the wall, to do their work. But there's people resisting and fighting. And he prays against those who are fighting against him and God's will. And so here's the next prayer. Prayer number five. Pray boldly for justice, then leave it in the hands of God. But pray for justice. When something unjust is going on, it's not only okay, it's good to pray against it. Oh God, it's wrong the way this person is acting. It's out of line. God, will you deal with them? Will you close their mouth? Will you stop people from listening to them? You know, imagine in your workplace, and some of you don't have to imagine, you know, in your workplace there's somebody who doesn't like you, so they're, they're kind of spreading stuff about you that isn't true, and they're trying to undercut, and they're whispering to your boss about this or that, and you just know something's not right. And you, can, and you know where it's coming from, but you can't prove it, but you're just going to say, man, you have the power of prayer. Lord, close their mouth. Lord, let them be seen for the liar that they are. Oh, that's a harsh prayer. Well, read Nehemiah's prayer. <laughs> um, Lord, let them go into the land of plunder. You know, it's like, oh, man, you know, there's, there, you know, Lord, I, but God, I'm not going to beat them up. I'm, but Lord, I want, Lord, will you deal with it? That is unjust. That is wrong. Lord, deal with it. We're allowed to pray like that? Yes. That's one of the many ways we can pray. God, bring your justice. I'll trust you to do it. Now, if God calls you to action in certain ways, take action. But in a lot of cases, it's just saying, God, I pray that you'll step in and resolve this situation and trust him. Prayer number six. Nehemiah 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 9. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed. Now, Strengthen my hands. That a great prayer. Simple prayer. One sentence. Now strengthen my hands. Here's prayer number six. Pray for power. Lord, strengthen my hands. Lord, strengthen my mind. Lord, strengthen my body. I'm weak. I'm weary. I'm tired. Lord, give me your power. Fill me with your spirit and your power and your strength. That is a beautiful prayer. Lord, Lord fill me with your presence and power. I need it. Parents need to pray this. Oh God, give me power and the strength I need to care for my kids. Whether your kids are this tall or your kids are this tall. Doesn't matter. Lord, give me the wisdom to know how to answer their questions. Give me the strength to love them well. Help me care for them when I'm just weary and tired. Lord, fill me with power. In your workplace, Lord, make me so fruitful and productive 
that, that it helps this organization forward, that it helps this company forward, that, that let me be a great teacher, a wonderful lawyer, let, give me skill as a doctor or as a nurse, Lord. I pray for the power to do the best I can that Christ will be seen in how I live my life and the excellence I live with in all the work that I do. When you're fighting a temptation, when, you, when you're battling an addiction, Lord, give me power. I don't have the strength I need. I cry out to you, fill me with your strength. And show me how to turn from this and walk in the right direction. Pray for the power of God. I love that Nehemiah, in the midst of this, says, now strengthen my hands. Pray for power. Prayer number seven. Nehemiah chapter nine, verse three. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confessing and confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. Now the wall's built. Now they're celebrating. So they tell everybody, we're going to have a great celebration. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to all get together and we're going to stand and we're going to read the Bible for three to four hours out loud. Who's showing up for that service? I mean, but they did. They read the word of God for a quarter of the day and then they worship and celebrate and sing songs of praise for another, another three or four hours. There's a church service, a six to eight hour church service, right? But, but there's, this, there's this sense that they, are, that they are praying and putting God's word with prayer. And I'll tell you something, there is something about knowing this book. There's a reason why every day of the year, 365 days a year, we have a Bible reading passage on the Shoreline app, on the bulletin, and on the website for you. All you gotta do is click on it, open it, and it gets you ready for the next Sunday sermon, right? But there's a reason we have scripture reading for every day, because we have to know this book. And, and so, so as we read the scriptures, we also learn to pray the scriptures. Not just the promises, but just the teachings of God's word. So I'm doing a thing right now in my own life where I read, I read God's word each day, and I try to look for one direction for prayer. So, so maybe the prayer is, I just talked about pray, pray for power. So in my journal, I'll write down, here's my, you know, I, I spent time reading you know, this chapter of Nehemiah, and my key prayer focus is going to be God give power. So I'll, I'll write that in my journal. And then I'll just start putting initials. So I'll put KGH, that's me, Kevin Garth Hardy. I'll put KGH, and I'll just pray, God, give me the power I need and strengthen me to live for you. Then I'll put SLH, Sherry Lynn Hardy. I pray for Sherry next. So then I'll just pray for Sherry. I put Z and C, Zach and Christine, my oldest son and his wife, I'll pray for them. And I pray through each of my kids. Then I pray for some of you. I pray for some of our leaders in the church, people in different ministries. I pray for pastor friends of mine. And I usually end up with about 10 to 15 to 20 initials of people as I pray for them. But every day when I pray, I'm taking that prayer from God's word, something out of God's word that spoke to my heart, and I make that my prayer. Bringing prayer and God's word together is powerful. That's why we have on the, uh, on the Shoreline app and on the website and in your bulletin, every week, year-round, we have daily reading from the Bible and also weekly prayers. And we actually give you two or three directions for prayer. Why? Because reading God's word and praying through those things of God's word, it's powerful. And so we see Nehemiah bringing together scripture and prayer. I'd encourage you to do that. Read God's word and let it lead you to prayer. Use the prayer guide that we have that's, that's in our bulletin and on our website along with the scripture reading and grow in prayer. Combine, so lesson seven, combine prayer and God's word and, and, and just take that seriously in your life. Prayer number eight, Nehemiah 9, 33 to 35. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully, he prays to God, while we acted wickedly. Our kings and our leaders, our priests and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the statutes you warned them to keep. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. I call this Lesson number eight, lift up honest historical prayers. No revisionist history before God. When you pray to God, be honest. You want to know why you should be honest to God? He knows. You can fake your spouse. You can fool your kids. You can trick your parents into thinking things are fine. But you can't stand before the God who made you and the God who made the universe and pull the wool over his eyes. It doesn't work that way. So if you're weary and you're tired, you come to God. Don't, don't, get, don't revise history. Don't try to cover things up. Just say, God, I'm exhausted. I feel like I got nothing left. I feel like I'm poured out and poured out. And if I gotta 
take one more test or change one more diaper or write one more report or go on one more assignment. I just, God, I got nothing left. I cry out to you as I am. God wants to hear that. God loves prayers when we are just, we don't revise what happened in the past or what's happening right now. We just tell God where we are. And when we look at our past, you know, you, you, can, you can reshape the past to try to trick people in your past, but God knows. So you say, God, this is my journey. This is where I've been, but I need you with me now. I need you with as I go forward. And, and so don't revise things or change things. Just, just be totally honest with God. I remember a guy who I, I shared the gospel with over the course of a number of months, and he finally became a Christian, and we, we prayed together, and he started confessing his sins in this prayer with me. It was just he and I in my office, but he, started, he, he just started confessing his sins, and he got like really specific and really detailed, and he was just saying sin after sin, and I'm kind of like, I'm going to go, la, 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 I can't, you know, I want to, I don't want, I'm like, I, I felt like I shouldn't be hearing this. I'm not a Catholic priest hearing confession, I'm, you know, but, I, but, but this guy just said, God, blah, you know, here it's all of it. But, I, but God knows us, so when you pray, honest historical prayers. Don't revise them. Don't revise what happened in the past. Don't try to change who you are now. Just put, so, so who you are, and then God can, with his power, change you for the better. Prayer number nine. Nehemiah 12, 27. Now the wall's rebuilt, and they're celebrating. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving, with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. Here's the last powerful prayer lesson from Nehemiah, number nine. The power of praise and celebration. The power of praising God and celebrating his goodness and declaring his goodness. This is why every week when we come together, we sing songs of praise to God. There's something about lifting our voices together to glorify God that brings him delight and that fills our souls. But you can do that when you're alone, driving down the road in your home alone to sing a song of praise. I, I, when I was a new Christian, I would make up songs of praise and sing them at the top of my lungs. But here's how I would do it. I worked for 7-Eleven, and I was, I, was, I was 15, not quite 16 yet, and I would fill the, I was just basically, you know, filling, uh, taking all the six packs of beer and putting them in the slider so they go down and fill up to the window there, and I'd do the Coca-Colas and, you know, stocking the, the cooler. So they had these fat, loud fans, uh, fans going, and it was really loud, and so, so I'd be in there, and I would, just, I would just make up songs of praise to God. I was a new Christian, and I didn't grow up in the church, so I didn't know I was learning some praise songs, but I didn't know any of that stuff. So I was just like, was, when I was stalking the freezer, I'd be just like, you want me to show you how, want me to sing like I did there? No, I'm not going to. But I mean, I was just like, just, I was just like, God, I, it didn't rhyme, and it didn't, you know, I was just like, God, I thank you, and you're so great, and I was just, and thank you for loving me, thank you for giving me, and just with all my heart, and every so often it'd be like, Vroom. when someone would open a door, and I'd be like, oh, I'd stop. <laughs> so they'd hear me screaming prayers to God, and then they'd close it again, and I'd go back to my singing, screaming praise to God thing. And, uh, there's moments now where I look back and I think, I, I wish I had that same passion. I, there's moments I do. But man, I wish I could just, just cry out to God. You're so good. You've loved me so well and I'm so undeserving and you've washed me clean through Jesus and, I, and you've blessed me in so many ways and God, in the hard times, you never leave me alone. And just to cry out to God and to praise him, that's, that's the heart of God's people. That should be our hearts to lift up songs of praise and prayers of praise and celebration because God has been good. And so, God, we do that right now. We just lift up to you and say, God, you have been good to us and you have loved us well through the grace of Jesus, undeserved cleansing of all of our sins. God, it's hard to even comprehend what you've done for us. You've called us your sons and your daughters and you've said we can call you Abba, Father. God, you've been so good to us, so help us to celebrate you and worship you and praise you and help us, Lord, to confess honestly to you and help us to pray in the moment and, Lord, help us to, 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 to not change who we are in the past and act like anything other than we are because, Lord, you know us. And, Lord, we pray that even as Nehemiah, through all the surprises he faced, found the one constant of being in your presence and talking to you, Lord, may that constant of prayer be our strength with every surprise that comes our way. Remind us that you are with us, your heart is open to receive our prayers, and you're ready to speak and to lead and to guide us as your children. We give you praise for this reality. Help us live into it in a fresh new way. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.